I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak. I'm gonna to talk to you today about some of our work uh, in cardiac tissue engineering, uh, specifically a biomimetics approach to engineering arterial conduits for congenital heart surgery. Congenital heart disease affects roughly one in a hundred live births or about 40,000 births every year in the United States. Uh, approximately one quarter of these cases are considered severe, meaning they require surgical intervention or catheter-based intervention within the first year of life. As our outcomes have continued to improve, we have created a large population, currently about 3.3 million cases of people with congenital heart disease living in the United States alone. Congenital heart disease itself encompasses a wide range of defects, including things as simple as quote unquote holes in the heart or septal defects, and as complex as univentricular physiology, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, where literally half of the heart has not developed. Just a quick refresher on cardiac anatomy. If you look at the anterior surface of the heart, the muscular portion, uh, most anterior in the chest is the right ventricle. It's a chamber that pumps blood directly to the lungs. The left ventricle is the systemic ventricle. It brings blood to all your organs. Uh, we're gonna be talking a lot about the connections of these ventricles, particularly the right ventricle to the lungs. Uh, that happens uh, through a valve, the pulmonary valve, uh, into an artery called the pulmonary artery, which then bifurcates into left and right branches. So in the normal physiology, the right ventricle will pump blood to the lungs, the lungs will oxygenate it and then send it back to the left heart via the pulmonary veins. Uh, there is a subset of congenital heart defects that involve malformations, either in the right ventricle, kind of the, the pulmonary valve or the pulmonary artery itself. Um, an example, truncus arteriosus is a defect in which rather than two separate great vessels developing, meaning uh, the aorta bringing blood to the body and the pulmonary artery bringing blood to the lungs, a single outflow artery uh, arises from the heart that brings blood both to the systemic organs as well as to the lungs. Uh, this common blood vessel is called a truncus. Um, part of the surgery to correct or repair this involves separating the pulmonary artery portion from the aortic portion and invariably this leaves the patient with discontinuity, meaning there's no longer any connection between the right ventricle and the lungs. And so as part of the surgery to repair this, we'll use a conduit. Um, in this particular picture, the conduit here is a homograft, and that literally means just a connection between the ventricle and the separated pulmonary arteries. Um, conventional therapies and, and conduits that we have now um, do not have the ability to keep pace with somatic growth. And so this lesion is often repaired in the first couple of weeks of life with a conduit that is on the order of nine to 11 millimeters wide and cannot grow. And so as the child ages, they very quickly outgrow this conduit uh, and require another surgery strictly to replace that conduit. Uh, you can imagine if this uh, conduit lasts two or three years, uh, we can upsize it slightly. However, we've got a vicious cycle of constant reoperations to replace conduits just to keep up with somatic growth with a child. And it's not uncommon for an infant that has truncus repair using a homograph to require three or more surgeries just to get through the teenage years to adulthood. Another operation um, that employs the use of conduits is the Ross operation. In this case, if the Aortic valve is malformed or insufficient and needs to be replaced. We can use the pulmonary valve and artery as an autograft and replace the aortic valve. But in doing this, we've again created a situation where there's no continuity between the right ventricle and the pulmonary arteries. And as part of the Ross operation, uh, we employ again, either a homograft or other synthetic conduit that does not have the ability to keep pace with somatic growth. I've already alluded to this, but current prosthetic conduit options include homograft, which is cadaveric tissue donated similar to how a kidney or a liver would be donated for organ donation, completely synthetic grafts, in this case, Dacron or Gore-Tex tubes, 
or uh, this is a jugular vein from a cow uh, called a contegra graft. Uh, it doesn't matter. These are all off the shelf products. None of them are capable of keeping any sort of uh, growth potential in them. So whatever size you implant, they, they stay and sometimes even shrink and stenose down. Uh, similar thing happens with valves. When we operate on adults, we can replace valves with prosthetic valves because we don't need to worry about somatic growth anymore. But you can imagine if you have to replace a valve in a two month old infant, first of all, they don't make prosthetic valves that small. And even if they did, they would very quickly outgrow them. So uh, in our lab, we've chosen to employ uh, what we call a biomimetic tissue engineering approach. You know, if you were to take a step back and say, what are the, the goals of, of a project like this? You know, the holy grail would be to be able to engineer a replacement that is fully functional upon implantation, meaning as soon as we put it in, it needs to work. Uh, the child needs blood flow to their lungs and a competent valve. Uh, ideally, it would have the capacity to keep pace with somatic growth and avoid this constant cycle of reoperation as the child outgrows the implant. Um, it should be composed of a non-immunogenic material that's not going to elicit an immune response or cell-mediated destruction of the graft. And ideally, it's something durable that, you know, the best case would be last an entire lifetime. The term biomimetic approach comes from my PhD uh, mentor back in New York, Gordana Vunyek Novakovic. Uh, the basic concept is to move away from traditional two-dimensional tissue culture where you grow cells in a flask under very unnatural conditions and change the media once in a while and um, study them uh, in a very unnatural state. Her driving uh, goal was to create culture conditions that would mimic the physiologic environment. So if you were, for instance, trying to engineer or grow bone, you would want to come up with a system that allowed you to statically load the engineered construct, much as bone undergoes static loading while you go about your daily activities. Similarly, if you were looking to culture cardiomyocytes, for instance, you might want to employ electrical or physical stimulation or stress to them to mimic again their developing environment. Um, it uh, leads to some pretty complex designs as far as uh, culture approaches, but the end result uh, in theory is to better differentiate cells and guide them down a pathway that you would like. Uh, whether you do this with biologic cues, physical cues, or some combination thereof, um, you use the natural environment to guide your parameter selection uh, and in theory end up with a better construct. So given that we were aiming to engineer pulmonary artery conduits to restore right ventricle to pulmonary artery continuity, um, we approached it from the, you know, that perspective, um, we needed a few things. We needed uh, a scaffold or something to physically link the ventricle and the pulmonary artery. Uh, we needed a cell source, because uh, obviously the scaffold itself isn't gonna grow without a cellular component. Uh, and then we needed to somehow mimic the conditions that would be present in a growing or dynamically loaded pulmonary artery. We did this by first uh, choosing decellularized pulmonary artery as our scaffold of choice. I had done some work um, during my graduate thesis decellularizing myocardium and demonstrating that you could preserve the extracellular matrix components of myocardium uh, and keep the signaling intact, um, as well as retain a lot of the mechanical properties. So pulmonary artery decellularized seemed like a natural choice for this project. Um, Luckily, we were able to collaborate with Dr. Kearns Yonkers. Her lab has done a lot of work isolating cardiac progenitor cells from both sheep and human cardiac tissue uh, and has developed protocols for differentiating them into vascular smooth muscle endothelium cardiomyocytes. Um, and uh, she has studied these cells extensively um, and maintains a, a coronal bank of, again, both ovine and human progenitors. So that was a natural uh, collaboration that developed there. And then finally, the perfusion bioreactor portion, um, we uh, had to construct with some, some 3D printing and fabrication. Um, and I'll show you a series of experiments where we honed in on the parameters, but uh, we developed a perfusion bioreactor system that could generate 
static and pulsatile perfusion based culture uh, over a range of flows and pressures that um, were pretty similar to what uh, would be seen in a developing animal or human. So the hypothesis then is that mimicking the physiologic milieu through pulsatile perfusion of a cardiovascular progenitor cell populated scaffold uh, should induce vascular smooth muscle differentiation uh, and create an arterial conduit capable of exhibiting somatic growth as well as the native mechanical properties and hemodynamics of pulmonary artery. Uh, as an experimental overview, we started again with native pulmonary arteries. Uh, I'd like to extend a lot of gratitude to the neonatology lab and Dr. Blood, who uh, was kind enough to allow us to harvest pulmonary arteries from fetal and newborn sheep. Uh, we developed a detergent-based protocol to decellularize these arteries. Um, and then used the cardiac progenitor cell population, uh, expanded in culture, and then seeded onto the decellularized pulmonary arteries to create a recellularized construct. Uh, and then once we had done that, we went through a series of experiments to uh, define what the best culture conditions uh, using the pul pulsatile bioreactor would be to generate our desired end product. Okay. Um, we'll go through these each step in more detail, but once the pulmonary arteries were recellularized, um, we looked at varying durations of both static uh, and pulsatile conditioning and culture. The detergent protocol itself is uh, pretty standard. It used sodium dodecyl sulfate, um, which is an anion surfactant that lyses cells, so literally just ruptures the membranes and allows the cytoplasmic contents to be washed away. Uh, this was followed with a uh, trite next step, which is a non-ionic surfactant that helps solubilize soluble, some of the SDS for removal. You can imagine that stuff is toxic to not just the native cells on your scaffold that you're trying to get rid of, but to anything that you would reseed it with in the future. So it's critical to get the detergent out after it's served its purpose. Uh, we did this using both the trite next and then a pretty heavy 72 hour wash cycle, um, which relied on both mechanical and just the uh, dilutional uh, time to remove the detergent. Um, we did this to both pulmonary and, and aortic roots. In the beginning, you can see here in the flasks, these are cross sections of pulmonary artery and aorta and what they look like after they've been decellularized. The matrix proteins that are left are remarkably well conserved across species. So uh, kind of long-term, we were thinking you had the potential to use a xenogenetic starting material, pig or cow or any other pulmonary artery. Since you're removing the cells, it shouldn't generate an immune response. Um, the structural and mechanical properties uh, are very well preserved post decellularization uh, and the matrix components are uh, retained despite the relatively harsh conditions of decellularization. Um, there was a little bit of a learning curve, so I had to adapt the protocol that I had previously used on cardiac myocytes for somewhat thicker, uh, less porous tissue. Uh, you can see on the left, this is a H and E stain where the collagen fibrils are lighting up pink. Um, on the left, if you have inadequate decellularization, as we did in these samples, you have a lot of retained cellular contents that will stay in purple. Uh, retain in the scaffold. Um, whereas if you blast it or uh, go to the other end of the spectrum, the, the process is harsh and can get to the point where not only does it remove all the cellular material, but it starts to degrade or destabilize your matrix elements also. So on the right, you can see the collagen fibrils have been um, very uh, unorganized for lack of a better word. Somewhere in between is, is where you wanna be. Uh, so once we varied the parameters and got a handle on the process, this is an example of good decellularization on the left. You can see again, all the nuclear material of native pulmonary artery tissue. And then after uh, our decellularization process, complete removal, but retention of the structure of the underlying matrix. Uh, you can imagine in any chest tissue that's going to stretch, um, you want to uh, 
again, remove the cellular components. So on the left, you have the red trichrome staining. The red is the, the cytoplasm from the vascular smooth muscles. Um, after you've removed all that cellular material, again, you can see kind of the collagen backbone and the fiber of the matrix. Uh, this was important to us. So we didn't just want the collagen maintained, but the elastin, which is what imparts the elasticity to vascular material, um, we figured would be a necessary component for maintaining the mechanical properties, uh, both in the dish and then after reimplantation. And we were happy to see that uh, our, our decellularization process uh, did not destroy the elastin content of the pulmonary arteries. So the black staining on both the left and right is native and decellularized pulmonary artery with the good maintenance of elastin. Finally, we took the samples over to uh, UCR uh, to take a look at them under the electron microscope. You can see on the left, again, the little round cellular bodies everywhere, pre-decellularization of native pulmonary artery, and then post, almost completely removed. And you're again left with this collagen backbone. Okay, so there's no gold standard uh, for how much residual DNA content can, can be there. Um, we quantified uh, how, my, how effective our removal was uh, using double-stranded DNA isolation, and we found about a 93% reduction in DNA content. I know you're probably saying, well, you just showed us slides that show no cellular material. This is uh, a lot more sensitive, so there was no gross cellular material, but you can imagine as those cytoplasm and nuclei rupture, they're going to leave behind some DNA material. Uh, this is within the limits of what's been clinically acceptable for uh, recellularization. Um, in prior studies, we have used the DNA step, um, and that will give you about another tenfold reduction, uh, meaning it will bring your DNA's residual DNA's content under 1%. So if we were to proceed clinically with this, that step would need to be added in given the unknown biologic activity of residual DNA. Okay, so we've talked through the detergent portion. Let's move on to the seeding in the cells. So the kearns yonker lab has, uh, again, done extensive work showing that the mesodermal precursors that can be isolated from native cardiac tissue are islet one positive cells corresponding to cardiogenic mesoderm that uh, has the ability to differentiate into smooth muscle endothelium and cardiomyocytes. This is just a, a dexamethasone stimulation that uh, is known to drive the CPCs down all three of these pathways, showing uh, up expression of smooth muscle actin, troponin, and volumen factor after dexamethasone expression. Now, you can imagine if you're trying to regenerate cardiac muscle, you're going to want all three of these cell types. But if your goal is to recellularize a pulmonary artery, uh, you definitely want the vascular smooth muscle and the endothelium, but the cardiomyocytes are going to be out of place and uh, you'd prefer if they didn't start growing inside your vessels. Okay. The actual seeding process uh, is shown in the video down here on the right. Uh, you saw there's some thickness to the decellularized specimens. Uh, so we used a 27 gauge tuberculin syringe to create linear tracks within the wall of the vessel. And then uh, used a series of eight of these linear injections. I'll play the video here. This is Colonox. Demonstrating this receiving technique. Okay, so we spent a fair bit of time then uh, working on the reseeding methods, trying to get a handle on what the optimum number of cells uh, would be. And then part of this was guided just by our practical limitations, meaning uh, you can only generate so many million cells um, over time in culture, uh, and you have to balance uh, the cell needs with what I hope will be the, the clinical application, meaning if you have a child that needs surgery, 
and you plan on operating in the first couple of weeks of life, then you probably need a culture period that's not going to exceed a couple of weeks. So we tried two different doses, meaning we injected 5 million and 10 million cardiac regenerator cells into the scaffolds uh, using the method just shown in that video. I uh, found a couple of interesting things. The first is that uh, a large portion of the cells you inject, uh, you lose. This is a common theme in cell therapy, whether it's directed cardiac injection of embryonic stem cells or seeded constructs that are reimplanted later. Uh, cell survival and retention immediately after delivery is never 100%. In fact, it's rare that it's even 20%. Uh, you can see in the graph, when we injected 5 million cells uh, a week after injection, when we went back to quantify how many were in the graft, uh, it was somewhere on the order of 2 million cells. Uh, if we left that construct in culture for an additional week, there's evidence that there was proliferation of cells on the graft and that two weeks of culture would give us grafts with about 8 million total cells on them. If you compare that to the slide on the right, increasing the delivered number of cells to 10 million, uh, would result in about 3 million cells on the scaffold after a week uh, and roughly 8 million after two weeks of culture. So even though we doubled the number of cells delivered, uh, we weren't getting a very big increase in uh, the cellularity of the grass either at one or two weeks. So we decided to go with a 5 million cell injection um, for the subsequent studies. Okay, so we've spoken about the scaffold, namely the decellularized pulmonary arteries. Uh, we've spoken about the CPC cells and the injection. The final piece of this puzzle is the culture conditions. So uh, our theory was that pulsatile culture would have a effect on the differentiation and the phenotypic uh, end result of the differentiation of these cells, not knowing which of the three pathways uh, we would expect. To see on the scaffold, our hypothesis would be that hopefully pulsatile culture would, would generate vascular type cells, um, but we had no way of knowing this. So we compared the pulsatile conditions to static culture where the constructs were seated and then just submerged in media, but did not receive any perfusion. Um, and we cultured these things for a total of either one or three weeks under both sets of conditions. Again, static culture just involves submersion of the seeded construct in 20 mLs of CPC growth media, uh, maintained at 37 degrees with media change every other day. Pulsatile, uh, we did allow 24 hours of cell adherence. So there was 24 hours of static culture, uh, at which point the constructs were then mounted in a perfusion chamber uh, and put in circuit with a centrifugal perfusion pump which then perfuse the same CPC growth media uh, at the same temperature with the same 5% CO2. This is just a schematic of uh, how we constructed the perfusion bioreactor. So um, you can imagine if you Google or go to your Sigma catalog and look up perfusion bioreactor, you're not gonna find too much. Uh, most of these systems are homegrown. Ours is no different and involved taking a trip down to the basement and rooting through the storage closet to see what sort of pumps and chambers and, and control modules we could find. Um, and luck would have it, the uh, hospital has moved away from the sarin centrifugal rota pump into a newer system, but has a whole bunch of clinical grade sterile pumps and controllers. So we borrowed one of these. Um, worked with uh, a colleague of mine at Columbia to come up with a perfusion uh, chamber wherein the constructs could be mounted on Dremels under uh, sterile conditions uh, and then placed in line with this pump as a driver. Uh, we even found a old ICU monitor that could transduce pressures for us. Um, and then went through a, a series of experiments, namely just uh, dialing up uh, different flows on the pump and seeing what sort of pressures we could generate uh, in the constructs. Uh, the point here, uh, if you take systemic blood pressure, for instance, in an adult, we say it should be 120 over 80. So 120 millimeters mercury systolic and about 80, give or take, 
uh, moving is mercury diastolic on the pulmonary side, the pressures tend to be much lower. So a healthy adult or child, even, uh, you would expect pulmonary pressures in the order of 20 to 25 systolic and, you know, 10 to 15 diastolic, um, mean pressures in the 15 to 20 range, uh, which we were able to, uh, faithfully recreate with this system. This is uh, just a video of all the components put together. So that's a tra pressure transducing catheter in a unseated or decellularized construct mounted on the Dremels. And we'll show you what the pulse style perfusion looks like. There you go. Okay. Okay, and then the final component, we spoke a little bit about the cells again, but using that radial injection method, we would see the multipotent progenitors onto those scaffolds and then place them into the perfusion apparatus. Now, I alluded to this before, but ideally, the pulsatile perfusion, we would hope, would generate differentiation into vascular smooth muscle and endothelium, uh, but not necessarily cardiomyocytes. So in order to try and get a handle on uh, where these cells were going. Um, this is a look at several different markers. Uh, islet one and CKIT are markers of stemness, uh, as is brachyuri. KI67 is a proliferation marker, meaning actively dividing cells will express more of it. And when we placed uh, the cells on the constructs in each of our four conditions, namely static culture for one week, static culture for three weeks, pulse style culture for one week, and pulse style culture for three weeks, uh, a number of interesting patterns emerged. The first is over time, the cells under all the culture conditions uh, would lose these markers of stemness. Uh, if they were put in static culture early on, uh, there was proliferation as shown by the KI67 that correlated with an increase in the islet one and seek it expression, but over time, we'll get one week static and three week static. Uh, these early stemness markers would go down. That's uh, consistent with cells that differentiate. Uh, they lose their stemness markers and pick up lineage markers. Um, interestingly, pulsatile cultures seem to drive uh, this process faster and more completely. Um, and then finally, KI67, again, is a proliferation marker. Uh, under any culture condition, over time, the cells became less proliferative, although it was more pronounced, again, with the pulse style culture. Okay, so cardiac, my, cardiac sorry, cardiomyocyte markers, troponin T and myosin light chain. Um, you would hope, again, that uh, over time, you would get rid of these markers if you don't want cardiomyocyte differentiation in your system. Uh, pulsatile culture demonstrated uh, at the three-week time point a reduction in both troponin and myocyte light, uh, light chain. Uh, static culture actually uh, showed some increase in both markers. Endothelial cell markers, on the other hand, PECAM and von Willebrand factor, um, all the culture conditions uh, <laughs> quickly abrogated these markers, meaning we, at least in the culture, we're not seeing any evidence of endothelial cell differentiation by uh, PCR. Um, on the one hand, it, it would be nice for the CPCs to differentiate down this lineage. On the other hand, if we were stuck to choose between vascular muscle and endothelial cells, we know from our clinical experience that anytime you implant anything, whether it's synthetic or biologic into the bloodstream, your body is very good at very quickly endothelializing it. Uh, so. I wasn't overly concerned with this because uh, there's some hope that uh, even if the cells on the graph don't generate endothelium, your native endothelial cells will probably uh, repopulate the construct pretty quick once you're in vivo. Okay, before we get into the smooth muscle markers um, and results, I just want to draw one distinction. Uh, and this was actually not necessarily expected uh, when we went into the experiments, but uh, as smooth muscle cells differentiate, uh, they can take on uh, a couple different phenotypes, uh, either synthetic or contractile. The synthetic phenotype is sometimes considered a little bit more de-differentiated uh, and is associated with increased proliferative and migratory capacities. Uh, 
So synthetic smooth muscle cells will express smooth muscle actin, but don't necessarily express a lot of the contractile apparatus uh, markers like calponin and myosin heavy chain, for example. Whereas uh, further differentiation of this synthetic phenotype will lead to a contractile phenotype where not only is smooth muscle actin expressed, but also calponin and myosin heavy chain. These cells are capable of generating contractile force, but they lose their ability to proliferate and migrate as they do this. Okay, so uh, this is a look at all three markers. So smooth muscle actin, calponin, and myosin heavy chain. And what we found was early on, uh, neither pulsatile nor static culture were generating uh, any signal for any marker. However, uh, smooth muscle actin at three weeks of static culture showed a lot of upregulation and only the three week pulsatile culture uh, resulted in this uh, calponin or myosin heavy chain expression, which again would correlate with more of a contractile phenotype. So at least from this data, what emerges was a picture of uh, short-term culture getting rid of endothelial expression, down-regulating cardiomyocyte expression, but not showing any smooth muscle expression. Uh, and then over longer time periods, uh, the three-week pulse style condition in particular, uh, generating a contractile phenotype of vascular smooth muscle differentiation. Whereas three weeks of static culture was associated with uh, smooth muscle differentiation, but maintenance in a more de-differentiated state. This is some immunohistochemistry now. Again, looking at constructs that have been cultured for three weeks. Uh, on the left is normal pulmonary artery, positive control. The red staining is smooth muscle actin. And on the right, you can see uh, our recellularized construct three weeks showing smooth muscle actin staining. This is more immunohistochemistry looking at KI67 staining. So KI67 again is a proliferation marker. Uh, that green in the nucleus is considered a positive stain. And we were seeing proliferation both uh, in our positive control and in the recellularized constructs. Endothelial cells, uh, we mentioned this already, but by PCR, we were not seeing any endothelial cell uh, expression at any time point. On the left, the positive control, you see the luminal endothelial staining like you would expect. And in our scaffold, the lumen is not showing any staining. So consistent with the PCR, we were not seeing endothelial cell staining on the constructs. Uh, and then finally, cardiomyocyte expression. Even though we had some PCR markers uh, at three weeks, uh, we were not seeing any staining by immunohistochemistry. So uh, unlikely that there was any mature cardiomyocyte phenotype within the scaffold. Okay, now this gets into the differentiating between the contractile and the proliferative phenotype of vascular smooth muscle. On the left, positive calponin staining in native pulmonary arteries uh, shows ubiquitous expression. Now these are mature arteries that are expected to have calponin expression. Uh, our negative control, the decellularized construct uh, prior to seeding shows no calponin expression. And then if you proceed to three weeks of static culture versus three weeks of pulsatile culture, you remember the PCR data showed calponin expression under pulsatile but not static culture. And the immunohistochemistry verifies that negative staining at three weeks in static conditions, but positive with pulsatile perfusion. So the immunohistochemistry again correlates with the PCR findings. Okay, so then the next question is, it's good to have PCR or immunohistochemistry showing uh, markers for smooth muscle contraction, but it's even better if you can demonstrate uh, the contraction itself. So we collaborated with the Wilson lab, 
who had an apparatus capable of measuring force transduction in vascular rings. Um, we took a, a series of our samples over there, both native pulmonary artery tissue and decellularized tissue, and we're able to generate some standard curves. And so you can see here the response in gray of native tissue to uh, tetanic contraction. Uh, is this gradual increase in force transduction that plateaus, in this case, at about two and a half grams, whereas a decellularized sample after a cool abrasion of the bath generates no contractile response beyond the path of passive tension generated by the matrix itself. And we brought samples from all of our culture conditions over there. So we had the native tissue as the maximal response and the decellularized tissue as the kind of zero or uh, you know, intrinsic tension of the tissue itself. Uh, and what we found uh, was that the transduction experiments correlated with the immunohistochemistry, meaning only the three-week pulsatile condition, which had the calponin and myosin heavy chain expression, uh, was able to generate any kind of uh, force transduction or tension. Uh, and in this particular instance, it was uh, approximately 60% of the tension that the native pulmonary artery could generate. So not bad. So what do we conclude from our experiments? One, the detergent decellularization process could completely remove cells while maintaining the native extracellular matrix. Uh, our decellularized scaffold microenvironment was directing mesodermal differentiation into a synthetic smooth muscle phenotype. Pulsatile perfusion, committed cardiovascular progenitors to a contractile smooth muscle fate uh, and the combination of pulse without perfusion uh, may induce endothelial differentiation with longer duration. There was a hint of a response at three weeks, uh, although by staining, we weren't seeing it. So it was probably negligible. Okay. So now we've got a construct. We've got what we think are the ideal culture conditions. Uh, the next step is to see what uh, the tissue uh, we generated on the bench top handles like and whether or not it's feasible to do any sort of implant. Uh, for this, we used the juvenile sheep model. Um, we used an allogeneic model, meaning uh, we used the cell lines that were already available to us in the lab. Uh, this is in contrast to an uh, autologous model where we would first have to procure tissue from the juvenile sheep, uh, isolate and expand the cells and then go through our culture process. Um, for the initial studies, when we were more interested in feasibility and tissue handling properties, uh, we decided to go with an allogeneic approach, uh, although we have not ruled out an autologous one in the future. Uh, we did a total of six implants, three control, unseated scaffolds, so just decellularized scaffolds, uh, compared to three scaffolds that underwent the three weeks of pulsatile conditioning. The constructs were implanted as a patch in the main pulmonary artery. Uh, we did this without needing cardiopulmonary bypass or needing to arrest the heart, so we just applied a side-biting clamp to the pulmonary artery, uh, opened it up, and sewed the construct in as an onlay patch. Uh, the animals were survived for two weeks post-implant. We did baseline echocardiography and then repeated the echocardiography study at sacrifice. There's a video of the construct sewn in place. With the clamp removed. Okay, so first, uh, things we learned from our initial study, uh, the handling characteristics, suture handling, and, and strength of the patch were adequate for implantation over the two-week study period. Uh, here, this chart just shows the pre- and uh, post-implant diameters of the main pulmonary artery at the level of a patch, followed by the explant diameters, so we had no patch ruptures or aneurysm formation. 
Uh, in addition, the pulmonary valve uh, was not affected. We didn't see any insufficiency or stenosis of the valve and the right ventricular function was maintained. More interestingly, I'm sure the question is uh, what happened to the cells since uh, we had seated constructs in there. Um, if you go to the left, from left to right on the first row, this is again von Willebrand staining for endothelial cells. The native tissue shows luminal staining. The decellularized graft after two weeks of implant also shows luminal staining, which goes along with uh, native endothelial cells repopulating the graft, since we know that we didn't have any on there when we implanted it. And then this is the control animals. And then in our pulse style perfused recellularized grafts also endothelialization likely from native cells rather than implanted cells. Second row, smooth muscle actin. Again, native tissue, lots of smooth muscle within the wall, vascular smooth muscle, the decellularized graft shows you none. And then the recellularized graft shows smooth muscle cells within full thickness of the implanted specimen. Finally, calponin staining, again, mature pulmonary artery shows calponin staining correlating with the contractile phenotype of the vascular smooth muscles on the graft. The decellularized graft has no calponin staining, doesn't pick up any after two weeks of implant, whereas the pulsatile perfused graft maintains its calponin staining. Future directions for this work, uh, now that we've demonstrated feasibility and safety of a two week onlay patch implant, Ideally, we would move to longer term implants. We would employ cardiopulmonary bypass and rather than replacing just a patch of pulmonary artery, we would be able to replace the entire pulmonary artery uh, in something that's a, akin to what we do clinically. Uh, this would allow us then to assess not just the handling characteristics, but the growth potential of this graft long-term. The question of allogeneic versus autologous uh, is still undecided. Um, this was only a two week implant, uh, but we clearly had cell survivals after two weeks. Whether these were autologous or allogeneic cells, uh, we would need to do some further labeling experiments uh, to clarify that from a ease of application uh, standpoint uh, were an allogeneic uh, therapy able to work that's a lot clinically uh, clinically a lot easier to work with because um, it takes some of the time, time constraints out of the equation uh, as well as the need to procure biopsy to get the starting source material. Uh, so it's unclear in the long term again whether we would have cell survival uh, under such conditions. And then finally, we had talked when we started this experiment about the role of parasites and maintaining the normal kind of vascular signaling between endothelium and smooth muscle. So I would be curious down the line if we were to try and introduce parasites into the system, what effect they would have. But you can imagine the number of parameters we were already working with as far as perfusion parameters, culture, per culture parameters, duration, cell densities, et cetera, adding a, another cell type into the mix uh, would, I think, have overcomplicated this. but. Uh, something to look at in the future. And I, I'd like to thank all the people that helped with these experiments. I apologize if I'm leaving anybody out, but first and foremost, Dr. Karen Jonker. Uh, she's been remarkably accommodating and supportive of all these experiments. Uh, and I look forward to continuing to work with her in the future. Karen Garcia and Aaron Detheridge were experiment were students who uh, spent summer with us through the CERM Bridges program. Uh, Karen did a lot of the work uh, developing the culture conditions uh, and figuring out what, what the parameters would be closest to native pulmonary artery. Uh, Sean Wilson in the Wilson lab for all their help with the forced transduction and tension experiments. Uh, Dr. Arlen Blood for letting us uh, get a hold of all the tissue to make the scaffolds. Uh, John Hoff was remarkably helpful for all the histology, uh, the UCR electromicroscopy facility, and then finally the GCAT 
grant that funded all of this work. Thank you.